Today we'll talk about uh, ozone therapy in our practice and uh, we introduced ozone therapy several years ago but we were using a different format and Dr. McLeary uh, now is using so-called ozone pass therapy which is slightly different compared to what we were using in the recent past. So the principal question is uh, why uh, in integrated rheumatology office we would like to use uh, ozone therapy. So the answer is there are quite a few indications. There are several reasons for that. So uh, it's nice to have an extra tool. Uh, first of all, uh, it's nice to have a tool which is more or less benign uh, with not too many side effects. And uh, I see a great application of uh, systemic ozone therapy in uh, various areas uh, from, let's say, chronic myofascial pain, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, down to rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and chronic infections. And uh, I led Dr. McLeary to talk about uh, more kind of how ozone works, uh, what kind of benefits she sees immediately, and then we'll continue our conversation. Yeah, so at a very basic level, ozone is three oxygen molecules that are attached together. And the benefits of introducing ozone into the bloodstream has um, a few different benefits. At the, very, at the very basic level, what it's doing is modulating the immune system. So it's stimulating cytokine production, it's, stimulate, it's stimulating stem cell production, it's upregulating NAD in the body. And what does that mean? So in effect, what it's doing is it is encouraging the immune system to work more effectively. And that becomes important when we're dealing with patients who either have some sort of autoimmune disease going on, some chronic infection that is creating symptoms in the body. So um, that's kind of the basics of what ozone therapy is and why we thought it'd be a good idea. I would say that ozone therapy, from my standpoint, it belongs to the group of immune modulating therapy. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? If your immune system is underperforming, it'll bring it up. If your immune system is overperforming, like in, for example, in case of patients who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis, right, it'll bring it down. So it's basically, it's a classical uh, version of immune modulating therapy with minimal side effects. So uh, I'll let Dr. McLeary talk about various forms of therapy because mm -hmm. we can do it uh, utilizing ozone for IV infusions or using thorectal insufflation mm -hmm. and also uh, basically I would like you to talk about uh, the actual protocol, you know, how does it work in reality? Right. So to answer the first question, so there are a couple of different ways to get ozone into the body. The first way that we've been using here in the clinic for quite some time, even before I came here, was through the ozone sauna, where you'll sit in a steam sauna, the ozone is infused into the steam sauna, and it absorbs through the skin. So that's one way to get ozone into the body. Um, the second way, and a, a very gentle way, is through a rectal insufflation, where ozone is put into a bag, and then there's a catheter attached, and then it's applied rectally. Um, the reason to do that is the rectal mucosa actually allows the ozone to be absorbed into the body very easily. If there's any GI infection, it gets the ozone exactly where it needs to be in order to um, actually touch the infection. And then the final way is through the intravenous therapy that we've recently introduced here. Um, so the, the next question is kind of why would we choose one therapy over the other? The way that we get the most ozone into the body would actually be through the intravenous therapies because we're actually infusing the blood with ozone and then putting it directly back into the body. So for a lot of patients, that's probably going to be the most effective way and the most aggressive way to treat. Um, however, there are some patients, um, patients who have mast cell activation syndrome or who have POTS or who are very sensitive, who may need a more gentle way to introduce ozone into their body. And that's when we really think about using the rectal insufflation and or the ozone sauna. And all of those therapies can be used in combination or perhaps at different times during the treatment. And also would like to mention that, again, it, nothing is universal in medicine. So there are some patients who are thrilled about the therapy and they feel fantastic. And there are some patients who cannot tolerate this therapy, so it's not universal therapy, but success rate is quite high. So in general, uh, to summarize what we discussed, it's a very nice tool 
for patients with chronic illnesses mm -hmm. uh, because it allows you to reach uh, very significant therapeutic benefits with minimal side effects. Right. So uh, there's another aspect of ozone therapy uh, which has been published. So ozone therapy, systemic ozone therapy, uh, represents sort of clinic therapy for our blood vessels. So people who are prone to uh, coronary artery disease or stroke uh, definitely represent another group of patients who may benefit quite a bit uh, from ozone therapy. Uh, typically these are not immunocompromised patients and uh, the reason for ozone therapy will be to improve uh, the vascular performance, not physical but vascular performance. And that's another, I would say, great application of ozone therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Because there are some articles uh, showing reduction of plaques and overall load of atherosclerotic lesions uh, after administration of ozone therapy. So the question is, who basically uh, will not benefit from ozone therapy? So I would say patients who are on chronic anticoagulation therapy. So they may bleed after that, and so I just don't feel comfortable right. doing that. So that's number one. Uh, those who are pregnant would be number two. Those who are in process of getting pregnant, uh, I also would probably stay away from that. Uh, Patients that have a G6PD deficiency, right. Some absolutely genetic, a genetic uh, defect defects. that um, causes their red blood cells to lice under oxidative stress. Obviously, we wouldn't want to introduce an oxidative therapy for them. Patients who have hemochromatosis, patients who have thrombocytopenia, those are contraindicated for this therapy. Um, like you said, patients who have clotting disorders that are maybe or what, on poorly controlled, therapy. right? And then patients who have um, some, you know, more severe cardiac disorders that are poorly controlled. Other than that, um, like you said, the side effects are, are minimal. And depending on um, how stable the patient is, how sick they are, we can start slow and slowly work them up. So the question is whether you can just come over and get the therapy. So I would say, uh, ideally, ideally, you should be, uh, the prospective person should be examined at least. Mm -hmm and get some baseline labs. So it's a medical procedure. And like uh, every other procedure requires medical clearance. So there is minimal requirement, but still uh, we would like to have some ideas, you know, whether that particular person at any risk of having complications and will try to minimize any potential side effects. So the, if you would like to come, so you should sign with the clinic, uh, do initial evaluation, and then start it at basically no time once you're uh, requirements are met. Absolutely. That brings up a good point. Can just anyone do this? You know, we are talking a lot today about patients who have chronic infections or autoimmune disorders, but the ozone, ozone therapy can be very helpful to even um, somebody who is very healthy and not suffering with more challenging conditions. Um, patients who in the fall perhaps are just wishing to boost their immune system a little bit. Um, with the cold and flu season coming up, athletes who want to have a quicker recovery time or who are looking to enhance um, their performance, who just, so yeah, so it's good for people who aren't necessarily suffering with chronic infections as well, but absolutely need to be cleared and get some baseline blood work before we just jump right in. So uh, the question which also should be addressed is, what is the standard protocol, let's say, for systemic ozone therapy? So how frequently you would like to do it uh, and what's the maintenance? Because when we're dealing with a chronic condition, mm -hmm. a standard therapy incorporates loading protocol and maintenance protocol. Mm -hmm. So I would like you to answer this question. Yeah, absolutely. And the therapy needs to be individualized, obviously, um, between each person and what they're dealing with. Typically, I like to see, especially if we're dealing with chronic infections, I, like, I would like to see the patient do um, 10 sessions in a row. So that would be 10 passes once a week for 10 weeks. That would be ideal. And then after that, kind of reevaluate and see, do we need to do another 10 sessions or perhaps we've reached our goal and the patient can just come in for maintenance. And that could look like anything from every couple of months to maybe once, once, once a quarter. A month, so maybe yeah. Like so, uh, you know, there will be some patients who won't be able to do 10 passes right away. We'll need to start much slower. So in that case, the therapy would be drawn out 
over a longer period of time. And could you specify exactly for our listeners what is the pass? Yeah, absolutely. So when I'm talking about a pass, the way that the therapy works is um, the patient is hooked up to an IV type system. Blood is withdrawn, ozonated, and put back into the body. When we do that one time, that's one pass. So a patient can do up to 10 passes in one session. So 10 pass therapy means that during the session, uh, you do 10, 10, times. 10 times, you know, the blood goes in and out. Mm -hmm. And what's the typical duration of the 10 pass therapy? That's a great question. And again, it varies um, depending on the patient. It depends on the blood quality, how big their veins are. So how fast can we withdraw the blood and put it back in? A lot of that will be patient specific, but anywhere between an hour to two hours is typical for 10 pass. And another question is a practical question. Do you ask patients to do any special preparation because yes. of maybe they're not well hydrated? Maybe they need to, so what, mm -hmm. what are typical recommendations before the therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. So there is an entire um, protocol that needs to be done for the previous 48 hours. That would include hydration, absolutely. And not just day of, not just right before they come in, but for the entire 48 hours beforehand, making sure they're adequately hydrated. We ask them to refrain from zinc supplements for the 48 hours ahead of time, to refrain from alcohol for 48 hours ahead of time, and then also to have a greatly reduced fat and protein diet. Um, typically recommending a plant-based diet for the previous 48 hours so that the blood is as thin as possible so that it can be withdrawn and put back into the body um, as easily as possible. So would you recommend to take something like fish oil or creel oil before? Yeah, fish oil is great. Something like lumber kinase or natto kinase. Or um, serapeptase. Or serapeptase would be great um, if they don't have access to that, even a baby aspirin 24 hours ahead of time. Right. And another, it's a very practical question, can a patient drive back home or a person needs to have a rider? Absolutely, they can drive back home. They should, they should feel um, completely lucid and um, well during the therapy and then also after the therapy. Right. Well, thank you. I think that we covered most of the practical things. If you have any questions, please send us an email and we'll be more than happy to answer.